can see you at the moment. Perhaps that will emerge in a moment. Uh, but if I give you a little bit of background as to um, where we are, first of all, I'll introduce you to say that uh, we're all joined by um, Paul Wheeler, NSP. He's represented the South of Scotland region in the Scottish Parliament since 2011. And since 2000, June 2018, has been the Scottish Government's Minister for Energy, Connectivity and the Islands. Uh, his specific portfolio responsibilities include Scotland's energy strategy, renewable energy consents, Ireland's policy and implementation of the Islands Act, Scotland's ferries policy, and a Scottish Government investment programme in digital infrastructure. I'm not sure that the Scottish Government could have conceived a portfolio that would have been more relevant to the subject that we are talking about today. Um, Minister, we have about 94 people uh, on this um, uh, Zoom, Zoom call. Uh, about 64% of them are from various parts around uh, Scotland and about 36% of them are resident on Isla. And when we asked them why they attended this event, the majority of the people's uh, priorities were about um, the environment, building a sustainable future and thinking about our future generations. So that gives you a little bit of context as to why people have joined. And uh, I understand if time allows afterwards, but other than that, over to you. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Paul, and sorry for the, the delay in me joining. I didn't, I didn't have the um, ID code to join the Zoom meeting, so it's kind of fundamental. I just uh, hope that's, uh, that's not caused you big major problems. But I'm delighted to be here to speak today and in my capacity of Minister for Energy, Connectivity in the Islands. Uh, so I've got more than one uh, interest here, both as an Energy Minister and Islands Minister. And clearly I would have wished to attend the event in person, but unfortunately due to our current collective uh, circumstances, that's not possible. But of course, we all are learning of, uh, to do things differently in these challenging times, particularly in relation to working practices. And of course, technology is playing a key role in that. The pandemic continues to impact on all our daily lives, both a professional and personal level, uh, and will continue to do so for a while yet, unfortunately. But we are now carefully and cautiously uh, moving into recovery phase of the pandemic. So hopefully that uh, a little bit of light is at the end of the tunnel now. And as we do so, our aim is to ensure from the Scottish Government perspective, economic recovery promotes inclusive growth. Um, that, that includes geographically and within different groups within society, uh, creates opportunities for all and supports and accelerates our transition to a net zero economy. And I'd like to offer my thanks to those who've worked so hard uh, to make this event possible, including yourself, Paul, as well as uh, extend my appreciation to everyone attending today with an interest in the future of the Isle, uh, uh, Isla's um, energy uh, needs. Our islands will, of course, play a key role in Scotland's journey to achieving net zero emissions uh, by 2045, the net zero target, and they, do, they can be at the forefront of that transition. Our energy system, though, is, is changing fundamentally with renewable and low carbon energy providing the foundation of our future energy system, uh, as was first kind of trailed, I suppose, in our energy strategy in 2017, and we hope to update that um, later this year. A shift towards more localised energy solutions is, though, fast becoming a vital part of our journey collectively to net zero. So local energy systems uh, take a holistic view. They consider all options for generation and the use of heat, transport and electricity within a defined area. And in this case, it's obviously uh, easy to define that area. They aim to match energy supply and demand within defined areas such as Isla to the benefit of a range of people uh, and, and, and business uses. And local energy systems are of course focused on maximizing sustainability and efficiency something which is necessary in decarbonising Scotland's islands. There is still great uncertainty around what future en energy system will look like. However, that's um, obviously taken the context of what is clear, is that there will be more choice over how people produce, consume and purchase their energy within their communities. And, and to some extent, it's become uh, sort of very much more democrat uh, democratised as an energy system and distributed, and uh, that, that is maybe a good thing. The Scottish Government's Local Energy Policy Statement, published last month, sets out the importance of collaborative working and supporting the development of local energy systems and how early engagement with communities is going to be critical. And it's great to see this happening in practice, of course. So uh, I would want to say, though, however, the local energy landscape can be complex and it involves diverse groups of people and stakeholders, each with their own specific targets and priorities. And as we shift to more localised solutions, we will require an increasingly strategic approach one that considers how to decarbonise the whole energy system and also taking into account these individual objectives. And it's therefore important that we build strong local relationships to understand all of the diverse viewpoints and work together to build a shared vision that everyone uh, can get behind. Now, there will be tensions and differing views 
Uh, but by working together, we believe we can achieve so much more uh, than perhaps uh, is possible working individually. And Scotland's islands are all unique. And of course, that's a, a key theme in the National Islands Plan, uh, that every island should be treated as unique. An isla has its own individual characteristics, not least the, the dominance of the distilling sector on the island. But recognising those individual characteristics will be key to planning the journey to net zero and developing a local energy system. For example, physical characteristics such as geography, building stock uh, and existing energy infrastructure must be taken into account. Alongside the physical characteristics will be the need to understand the ambitions and priorities of the people of Isla, such as uh, reducing fuel poverty, creating new employment opportunities, and of course, reducing any decline uh, in population uh, across different communities. And additionally, our Scottish islands will have specific energy requirements, which must be examined with Isla requiring a future energy system to target specific issues surrounding electricity, heat and transport. And as the majority of Isla's energy supply is imported from mainland Scotland, it is important that we tackle issues specific to the island. I would want to say as well, as my, my own officials will be aware, I've got a key um, objective to see in, in the work we're doing around areas like hydrogen, uh, to see if we can make Scotland's islands exporters of energy rather than the importers. But anyway, in regards to the work we're doing, uh, this includes Isla's reliance on fossil fuels, high energy costs uh, to communities and reliance on unpredictable transportation due to weather uh, in, in delivering heat and fuel to the island as well. And it ties in with the other part of my portfolio around trying to ensure we have a more resilient ferry fleet going forward as well. And this underlines the, the changes required in how energy is generated, stored and used, both on Isla as well as nationally. And community engagement is going to be crucial in targeting these issues, with the Isla Energy Plan seeking to raise awareness amongst the community moving forward. And this will support the delivery of, we hope, of sustainable, low carbon and affordable energy for the whole community. And of course, you will all have ideas about what is possible, but potential actions include building local understanding of electric versus, or, or indeed combined with hydrogen based solutions, engaging with and supporting discussions with developers and promoting and assisting with the use of funding routes, uh, whether those are government or other alternative funding routes. And the purpose of today's event will seek to explore some of these issues further. It will build, as I understand it, on the early engagement work which has taken place over the last year and led by Argyll and Butte Council, Isles Isles Enterprise and Local Energy Scotland, who deliver, of course, the Scottish Government-funded Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, or CARES. The discussion today will help to inform individuals, the wider community as well, as the public uh, in, in general and private stakeholders in considering the development of Isla's future energy needs. The information shared may also be transferable in providing uh, future strategies to surrounding islands and act as a guide in building a strategy around future public and private sector investment as well. The range and number of people attending today, uh, as you've outlined, Paul, very much demonstrates that the people of Isla are interested in being part of that conversation and journey, and I warmly welcome that. I'm delighted with the level of interest indeed, and it's hugely encouraging that you all want to engage in the process. I do recognise, however, you're not starting from scratch. Some of you here today have been involved in developing renewable energy projects for the benefit of Isla and its community for a number of years, and it'll be good to draw upon those experiences today. I understand it's not the intention to reach a firm position uh, in this session, but to give everyone the opportunity to share views and receive feed feedback uh, from that. But to help stimulate discussion, an independent options appraisal was undertaken last year, which I understand will be built upon today in the conversations. And you'll hear more about this work shortly, but I would wish to re-emphasise that the scenarios presented uh, in the option appraisal uh, simply provide ideas for what's possible. They do not seek to provide the answer to Isla's future energy needs, so they don't see them as prescriptive. And this event today is a great start in beginning to understand the net zero pathway for Isla, one that plays to your own unique characteristics, uh, your own priorities and ambitions, and is informed by the views of the whole community. And I'm pleased to note that earlier this month, uh, the Argyll and Butte growth deal, Heads of Terms, was signed, confirming £25 million of investment from the Scottish Government to provide a sustainable support and to drive inclusive growth across the region as part of a wider £70 million package. And one of the priority areas is energy, of course, and it's anticipated that funding will be made available to complement and support this work on Isla. So thus highlighting the need for collaboration I mentioned earlier. There will be, of course, many factors uh, that will inform development and progress in the years ahead, not all of which are yet clear. And in short, the way ahead is not going to be straightforward. We know that uh, tackling the climate emergency is hugely complicated. 
But having a strategic vision to support a net zero journey will ensure that the transition is both inclusive and sustainable. And one that has, of course, the whole of Isla's diverse interests front and centre in its thinking. So just in conclusion, Paul, I want to end by offering my thanks to you all for giving up your time today to provide your input to the topics which will be explored through, throughout today's event. Uh, this is a really exciting project. It does demonstrate to me that you all have a desire to work together for the greater good of Isla and the people living on Isla. Uh, unfortunately, due to parliamentary business, uh, I'm not able to join you for the later discussion, but I am keen to hear um, and receive feedback from today's discussion, and I hope that you have a very successful event. So, uh, clearly, Paul, ha happy to offer up my, uh, my myself to take some questions in the remaining time available, and I appreciate I started late, so if you need to run over a bit, that's not a problem. No, 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 it's okay. It's, uh, thank you very much indeed. We, I just have a few questions I wanted to ask because uh, you very comprehensively covered all the issues, I think, that... Uh, um, we will come on to talk about a little bit more detail earlier on, but uh, you know a few of the things that um, perhaps the first one is an anxiety within the perhaps within the community that uh, you know the last the last person on island on Isla who will want to burn coal, well I need to have an electric vehicle. How will I afford to change these new technologies? How will I do that? How do you think those people should be thinking about what is a you know a very progressive strategy in terms of decarbonisation? At a governmental level, and how it gets down to somebody on an island in that way, what was what would be the message you would give them? Well, I, I think first the thing is to you know to, to thank those individuals who are clearly wanting to change. Uh, you know that's that's we should never lose sight of that. It's a big thing for them, and we need to kind of encourage and put our arm around them and help them as much as we can. For those who are facing the most acute fuel poverty, which maybe many of the people who are still in a situation where they've got a solid fuel system, and um, there are there is actually grant funding available, not just loan funding, but grant funding available. Uh, of up to £12,000 um, uh, per, per property for, for those who are most acutely at risk of fuel poverty. But clearly for those who are in a better financial position and, and less exposed to fuel poverty, there are incentives we put in place through uh, loan finance with upfront cash backs and other measures to try and incentivise investment in, in new technology. And uh, clearly that goes across both heat and transport. So there is uh, significant support now for individuals who are looking for lower cost finance to by either new or second-hand electric vehicles for and for heating, we've, we've put specific measures in place around heat and energy efficiency, both for SME customers through the SME loan fund, but also through specific um, uh, loan finance through available through Home Energy Scotland uh, to, to to individuals and households that want to decarbonise as well. So we we do appreciate it's it can be expensive. We appreciate that's not within everyone's budget. We are trying to help those who are most acutely affected financially. Um, and we are continuing to try and look to innovate in terms of uh, sources of finance available from the private sector, whether it's through you know, changes in mortgage products or, or associated financial instruments from, uh, from uh, traditional lenders to try and support people to, uh, to absorb that. The other thing I would just throw in the mix, which is maybe a future policy development, which would affect islands as well as mainland Scotland, is we are actively looking at heat as a service model at the moment as a government, as a potential way in which that takes the, 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 the key decisions around investment out of the hands of the individual. They just contract for a service from a provider and the cost of the capital uh, capital cost is met by that provider. Could be the government and a public energy company. It could be other existing utilities that might be able to take that forward as well. Is that what I would have heard about as the heat in building strategy? No, the heat in building strategy, I mean, it's, it's one element of it. Yes, the heat in building strategy is is looking at uh, what we need to decarbonise the both the heat and energy efficiency of domestic and non-domestic buildings going up to 2045. So in short, it's a potentially up to £33 billion programme to um, retrofit um, uh, existing properties and, and, and drive new builds to higher standards of energy efficiency and heat. And we, as part of that, we've committed, as you may know, £1.6 billion in the next five years of government money. Um, but that's, that's uh, just for that first year, five-year period. The total cost, as I say, for all the economy across all sectors private and public and third sector will be about 33 billion, the estimate, uh, to get us to where we need to be uh, by 2045. Thank you. I mean, we have a, a, one of the workshops this afternoon is, is specifically about awareness of this issue on Ireland. So we'll be able to feed back to your officials what level of awareness there is about these sorts of uh, things as, as, as we move forward. One of the, the next things I want to ask you about, which again is um, sometimes hard for people to uh, understand the a concern about wind energy or tidal energy and the ability to land that on Isla. People think, my goodness, surely, and there's sort of an attraction for developers to go straight to the mainland. And I understand there might be regulatory concerns and issues about that. 
-hmm. But do you think there's, there's an ability from a legal regulatory perspective to, to intervene in some shape or form in that to try and achieve those objectives? Or is that a very complex area? Just help us a little bit with that to be really good. Sure, sure, Paul. I mean, there's obviously, um, it touches on both reserved and devolved areas. This, I mean, the, the reserved areas are around the policy, around regulation of the markets, the, um, uh, the, the, the role of the regulator uh, in, this, in this sense um, you know, of GEM in overseeing the, the market stimulus for uh, in the private sector, largely private sector investment goes into grid connectivity. Um, so these are kind of key issues which are not within our control, but we try and influence um, as, as a government. Um, other areas where we have a control are in, in the consenting process and the license, marine licensing areas. And we are supportive um, in, in principle. I can't go down to specific sites, obviously that might be live, but in, in, in general terms, we are very supportive of uh, trying to sensitively use our marine environment, develop a blue economy through offshore wind and tidal and wave development. And clearly the island is an area that could be very attractive for um, either offshore wind or indeed um, a, a marine energy development as well. So uh, we have every interest in making that happen. Obviously, clearly we know that Isla at the moment is a community that has a significant net import of energy. I would love to see um, uh, Isla becoming a uh, either self-sufficient or ideally exporting energy to the rest of Scotland and that change the terms of trade of the island, if you like, in favour of being a net wealth generator uh, uh, in terms of rather than draining resource away from the island to buy energy from elsewhere. So I think um, uh, it very much fits with our, our strategy and we have had positive discussions with, with tidal developers, with offshore wind developers who've got an interest in, in Isla. So I think it's potentially quite an exciting time for the community. Now that comes obviously with responsibilities as well um, uh, when we're doing uh, the consenting process to make sure we take into account other interests such as the fisheries community and, uh, and other marine users uh, to make sure we get a balanced decision. Um, but, uh, you know, we obviously welcome uh, the, the strong interest there is in, in developing an island at the moment. And it's an area that um, obviously is a, a, a major user of energy, as we can see from the statistics. So whilst people might have been frustrated sometimes, these things take a long time. And, and you, you think that in the next period there should be some optimism that some solution might be found to, to allow this to be achieved over a period of time although it's incredibly difficult to be specific and it's a complex yeah. area is that how people should think about it there's probably some optimism. Yes. yeah probably yes paul i mean i know there's you know quite live uh, developer interest in areas like tidal energy in isla which is very exciting i know previously there's obviously been other proposals but we do have you know potential um uh, uh, very fresh kind of uh, proposal for, for development in isla and also, uh, the, the, I appreciate grid constraints have held back other renewable technologies up to now, uh, and that's a, a significant barrier. We've seen in areas like Orkney, um, some uh, innovation around the use of hydrogen as a way of getting around that. But obviously, we want to see communities like Isla, like Orkney, having full grid connectivity so that, that uh, the massive potential that the islands have can be, can be channeled sustainably into generating wealth on Isla uh, in this case. So, um, so I think it's it is a hugely exciting time. It's uh, it's a better position to be in that there's strong developer interest rather than not having any interest at all, and it's just about then managing that in a sustainable and sensitive way uh, to 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 benefit the island uh, rather than uh, cause it problems. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, yeah, we'll have to go on to talk about when wood come into this process later on uh, to try and get the awareness about the grid issues versus the offshore issues and, and all those matters. But the the last thing uh, I just wanted to clarify um, with you, um, not in a uh, not in a JFK, what can you do for your country way, but what's your message for the people of Isla, whether a business or whether they're an individual? Uh, the Scottish government has this ambitious, ambitious agenda. We know it's complicated. Uh, you know, I just read through some of the reports about, you know, what are you doing about hydrogen and anaerobic digestion, all these issues. But what is the real message you want to give the people as to how they can respond to jointly achieve the objective that is set for a, a cleaner, greener, better future for Isla? What's the one message? Ooh, <laughs> one, distilling it down to one message is, is difficult. All right, give I'll try and try keep it simple. <laughs> Um, I, I suppose the key, the key thing is that, that government can't do this on our own. Uh, we need the action of individuals and businesses and households, communities to, uh, to pull together. And in, in island communities, we do, we know we have uh, stronger, more cohesive communities in many ways. So in theory, the building blocks are there for kind of more concerted community-led action, um, individuals knowing where to go for information. And obviously, we need to facilitate that, give the information about what grant schemes are available, what loan schemes are available, um, how to engage in the 
planning and building and consenting process. And there are things we can do in the planning system to make life a little bit easier for people in terms of permitted development rights or or um, uh, you know, uh, issues like non-domestic rates where we're making adjustments for renewables and so forth. So I appreciate some of this comes with government having to put in place the necessary tools. Um, but just to, to just engage in it, think positively about what can be done. Um, clearly, we've got Local Energy Scotland involved in this session. They are great partners to work with in providing advice to community uh, groups and, and, and uh, community projects, but clearly for businesses as well. You know, have opportunities to go through you know, Zero Waste Scotland and other uh, government agencies to get support. And if, if, if you don't know the answer, ask. I mean, uh, you know, whether it's through any councillor, member of the Scottish Parliament, MP, they can, they can try and probe government for for details for you if you're if you're needing advice about where to start and um you know we'd certainly encourage as i say the the schemes i mentioned earlier the sme loan fund and um, that's a good one for businesses to invest in renewables uh, through to cares for communities to give advice around community-led projects so that the, the advice and the support is out there funding in many cases is out there and uh, the first step has to be taken because these are demand-led schemes by the community or the individual or the business coming forward and saying i want to do something and we, we can't we don't want to force anyone's hand and um, we, we just need uh, sort of enthusiastic partners to work with and we'll we'll do our best to support you to to invest in projects and there's key sectors in communities like isla like, like our, our distillers and great to see so many of them involved in today's session where i think there's really exciting opportunities to get win-wins um more renewable source of electricity for those businesses potentially using hydrogen or other biogases um, also looking at developing maybe uh, heat networks. I just got managed to get the heat network bills passed yesterday in the Scottish Parliament, stage three, uh, subject to the Queen um, uh, giving royal assent. That will become an act of Parliament. Next two years, we'll develop the, the frame, full framework for supporting heat networks. Somewhere like Isla, with so many distilleries producing heat that's going to waste, that's a potential revenue stream for the distillery to sell that heat uh, and to produce local heat networks. So hopefully that can help the economics of the business as well as doing the right thing for tackling climate change. and. Uh, you know, we, we are a willing partner, willing to work with the people of Isla uh, and to, to engage in this energy uh, strategy for Isla. And I hope, uh, I wish everyone great success in doing so. Well, I mean, Minister, thank you. We've been exactly 20 minutes, which was what was allocated to this time. Uh, very grateful for you appearing and answering all these questions. And I, I, I 